You're listening to The Tools, Part 3. An Optimal Living interview with Phil Stutz, Barry Michaels, and Brian Johnson. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome back to the Optimal Living interview series. Today, I'm thrilled to be chatting with Phil Stutz and Barry Michaels. This is going to be part three in our discussion on their great book, The Tools. I've raved about this book throughout our notes in our prior chats, and uh, Phil and I chatted, and then Barry and I chatted, and we covered three of the five tools. So there are five tools, and you can go back and listen to those interviews um, to hear the first three. Reversal of desire, which is basically dealing with fear. Um, The second one we talked about was inner authority, dealing with your shadow and insecurity, that sort of thing. And the third one we talked about was willpower and realizing you're never going to be exonerated from challenges and time's ticking. We're not going to live forever. Um, So check out those interviews for that. This is part three. We're going to talk about the two tools we have yet to discuss, which are active active love and grateful flow. So that's a long intro. Um, Phil and Barry, really appreciate you guys taking the time and I'm excited to explore. We are too. Thanks for having us. Thank you. All right, so let's start on a high level. For those who might be listening to this chat first, um, can you tell us what the tools are and how we use them in our lives? And then we'll talk about them in detail. Okay. A, 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 well, I think just to give you a little prelude or introduction to both of us, we were, we were old school and we were taught to do therapy in the, the old school way, which isn't as popular anymore. But basically, you would... Um, explore the cause of somebody's problems. You trace that cause from their past, and then everybody would be clear what the problem was, what caused it, but then the process would stop. We had no way to um, do anything about the present real-time effect of the uh, whatever it was, whatever the disorder was, and the problem was. So both of us, almost like in a combination of rage, disappointment, curiosity, creativity. We decided we were going to go into that gap right there. It's like when the other therapists stopped, we were going to begin, basically. So that's, that's my way of um, introducing the idea of a tool. So a tool is a, is a procedure, usually visual, not always, um, that will change your state, your state of mind, right at the moment you're using it. And um, just as an example of that, we'll probably get into a little bit later, let's say somebody is a warrior and you trace their worrying backwards. <clears throat> let's say they're, let's say it's me. My father was, was always claiming impending bankruptcy, just as an example. So he, he basically taught me to worry and um, he made me afraid not to worry. It's like if you're not worried, something terrible might really happen. So, so let's say I was the patient. We uncovered all that stuff. We found the effect on me of having a, a wor- worried father, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's great, but that doesn't solve the problem. So the tool, or any, but the, in this case, it's the tools of grateful flow. The tool would then show the patient that they could control the worry right in real time. And people are afraid to solve their problems, believe it or not. So it's not only can you control the worry and, and diminish the problem, but you're not going to get penalized for it. You're not going to get punished for it. It's really okay. So that's why I say a tool. So in this case, the, the symptom would be worrying, and the change of state would be a change to a state of gratefulness. But what the patient wants to know is, will I be less worried? Can I sleep tonight, etc. So you want to say anything about that, there? Yeah, that's a great explanation. I, You know... When I was a student, I'm a little bit younger than Phil, I I was frustrated with this seeming dichotomy in the field of psychology, and the dichotomy was between depth psychology, which is what Phil essentially described. It goes deeply into your past, and, you know, at its best, it really tries to explore forces in the unconscious that we're not, because they're unconscious, we're not aware of. And it was always set up as that's one sort of field of psychology and then the other field at the opposite end of the spectrum is behaviorism essentially the the sort of premise of which is we're all just programmable computers in a sense and forget about all this depth and unconscious stuff 
if you take a habit and, and I give you, you know, a way to change the habit, I'm going to give you something in real time. And if you use it, it, it'll overcome the habit, you know, kind of thing. And depth psychology frustrated me because there were never any solutions. You could just go deep and deep and deeper and deeper and deeper, but they would never give you a solution. And cognitive behavioral psychology bothered me because it just seemed so superficial. You know, it's just, it was almost like take a pill, you're better, you know, kind of thing. And I just sensed that human beings were deeper than that. What was so revelatory about meeting Phil, it's now 30 years ago, was that he had melded the two together and tools are the way he melded them together. Because a tool not only changes a habit, like if your habit is worry, you can use a tool and you will stop worrying at that moment, but it also calls upon and evokes forces that are so deeply buried in your unconscious, you never knew they existed. So I saw it as a melding of two extremes in psychology where you could not only change habits, but also feel that you were evolving as a human being. You were, you were expanding, you know, in a sense. And connecting it, to those unconscious powers, right? And channeling them exactly. in vital ways. So there's kind of a paradox, which is you, you get your chops you learn how to use these unconscious powers based on your problems. But that's just the beginning. Once you can solve the problem, you become very confident. And it's almost like the sky's the limit. Hmm, things were possible that I did not know were possible. And that, that's really what we're about, not just solving the immediate problem. And, and let me underscore something that Phil just said, which is it really changes your whole feeling about problems. Most of us just say, oh, God, I, I don't want any more problems. When you use the tools enough, you almost look forward to problems because you know that they're just going to evoke more and more potential that lies inside of you. It's amazing. Yeah. They become fuels for growth. I mean, bring it on, right? Our first tool of everything is an opportunity to grow. Yeah, this is, again, why I get so fired up. Uh, <laughs> one thing I want to oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Phil. The one thing I want to say, though, is there, especially now because therapy has advanced a lot in the last 15 years, there are a lot of people that nominally and, and verbally say yes, right, and that's the way to go, which is great, but it's not enough. The tools are very, very specific. The patient won't use the tool unless it's very specific, and they have to understand how it works, why it works, etc. That's why we have a lot of tools. Yes. And the bottom line is tools leverage problems into possibility. In, in, in five specific ways, in five specific problems. And in the, you know, the book, the first book, and I'm really excited to hear about the second book we're going to talk about toward the end of our chat today. Um, but basically four primary problems, right? Uh, the fear, the shadow insecurity, and then we're going to talk today about, we mentioned worry which is what we, we use Grateful Flow for, right? Um, let, let's, let's drill into that. So talk to us about Grateful Flow, the problem it's, it's solving, and how we can use that as fuel for our growth via Grateful Flow. Okay, that's, that's me, right, Pat? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, before I get into exactly what the tool is, I, I think it's worth a two-minute discussion about the, the, the power of thinking and its effect on people. You know, it's been said, it's trite, but it's been said so many times, the world is not how it is, it's how you think it is. And, you know, at this point it almost sounds ridiculous, but everybody forgets it all the time. So your thoughts will dominate and dictate how you see the world. And how you see the world, to a very large extent, is going to determine how happy you are, how meaningful your life is, how successful you become, even your health. And now, this has now been accepted by the straight psychiatrists. The, the reason it's been accepted is because they now have functional ways of studying uh, the brain and brain activity. So they can see, they can see it both on the front end, how, let's say, worrying would affect the brain, and they can also see it on the back end, if you can correct the worrying, how does that affect the brain? And one of the things they found is the brain is very flexible and pliable, much, much, much more so than they ever uh, dreamed. So that's a, that's a way of um, uh, introducing the importance of this. Now, the other thing, and I guess it's inevitable we're going to get into this anyway, because the second book is about part X. 
Part X is the devil. It's the part in every single human being that wants to screw you up. It wants to limit you. It wants you not to reach your uh, potential. It wants you to be unhappy. It wants you to hate other people. And ultimately wants you to hate God on top of everything else. So it's this sneaky little devil wandering around in your unconscious. Now, here's the thing about this that, that'll help people to use the tool. Look, the average person says, well, I'm worried, but I have good reason to be worried. It's very logical why I'm worried, right? Now, and that makes it harder for the shrink. Now, the first time I realized what was really going on, I was in medical school. I was in the, I was, I was finished the second year of medical school. And the second year, there were a lot of really difficult tests. I wasn't sure if I was going to pass the test or not. And finally, the last day came, and I realized I passed all the tests. And I was really worried, 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 worried. I couldn't sleep. I'm going to have to repeat the year or whatever. But I, I passed. I remember this as clear as day. I was walking into my dorm room. School was over. I was packing up all my crap to take it home. And the test must have been ended maybe 15 minutes before that. And I heard myself worry, uh-oh, you don't have a girlfriend. You're not going to have a date this summer. You're going to be alone all summer. And at that time, I was 22, 23. I said, something weird is going on here. I didn't even get a 15-minute break. <laughs> and I was just as worried about the girl situation as I was about the test, which also didn't make very much sense. And that was my first exposure to what we call Part X. You want to say anything about that? No, I think you're doing great. It, it, it propagates worry and it has an incentive to because one of the fastest ways to limit a human being, I mean, think about it. If you were the devil, how would you want to limit a human being? Just flood them with negative thoughts all day long. What that's going to do is limit their conception of their own potential, but it's also going to shift their conception of the world. You know, the world becomes a very hostile, dangerous place. When you're thinking negatively all the time, it's not a place that's going to support you for your ideas, that's going to celebrate you in any way. You know, people who think negatively really end up feeling like, ugh, why bother? Oh, the best I can hope for is just to get by. Yeah, so, so that brings us to, I think, two things that are, before we teach the tool to just remember, which is, number one, most of what you're thinking is wrong. The worse you feel, the more depressed you are, the more negative the thoughts are, the greater the chances that that's wrong. It's not 100%, but it's up to 98 99%. That's insulting to people. They don't like it. We, we're very egotistical about our thought processes and our minds. You know, we think we're the smartest thing in the universe. Don't tell me I'm wrong. I don't know what I'm talking about. They, they would rather have the thought be right if it was going to ruin their life, then have to say to themselves, I'm wrong. It's a peculiarity of human nature. That's number one. Number two, the content of the thinking, which is what I, why I told you that story about medical school. The content of the thinking is geared by part X, not to describe reality, not to tell the truth, not to help you, not to illuminate. It's, it's designed for one purpose and one purpose only. It's just what Barry said, which is to cripple you, destroy your potential, and place you in this imaginary but very, very negative world. Now, once you accept this, the game has changed altogether. And we like to do this because once we've changed the game, then it becomes all right just to focus on the tool and just to focus on stopping the worry itself. But in some patients, it takes them a while. It takes them a while to believe it's possible. And it takes a while to convince them that most of these thoughts are ridiculous. And you know, it's, can I just say one thing? Yeah. And it's an act of faith for most people to say, I have to work on these thoughts rather than trying to prove or disprove whether they're true. Yes. Like they're, they're bad for me. Even if, they're tr even if they turn out to be true, it's bad for me to worry. Hmm. Yes. I always use the famous example. I mean, I'm almost 70. So let's say in 20 years I'll be dead. There'll be a worm crawling right here, no question about it, unless I get cremated or something. So, um, but would it be a good idea for me to think about that? It's a true thought, but how could it possibly help me, you know, thinking about that? Now, there's a different way you can think about that worm, which is I don't have much time left. I better get going here, which would be a positive. But mostly, 
these the effect of these thoughts are even if they're right. What Barry said, it doesn't matter. They're still destructive. Um, now, should I go into the black cloud, Barry, first before we begin the tour? Or what do you think? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love that image. Okay, so if you, I'm going to have a picture of it. If you, it's in the book. Um, think about it like this. You're, um, let's say, a typical crotchety person, you know, maybe your uncle or your cousin or something. You, if it's you, don't admit it. You just pretend it's a relative. But it's the person walking around spewing out negativity. Some of it they're telling you, oh, it's a cloudy day, it's going to rain. Uh, my income tax was too high, whatever. But most of, most of it's just internal. Okay? But it never stops. It's a voice that's negative that never stops. Now, what happens is, or just you can visualize this, all these negative thoughts. Remember I told you before that the, your view of the world is dictated by what you think, not necessarily by reality. Think of all these negative thoughts like floating up and creating this cloud, and it's a big cloud. You know, if you take a really little kid and you take him out on a cloudy day, and, you, you know, like a four-year-old, three, three-year-old would have to be, and you tell him, you know, it's cloudy out, but there's a sun above there, the kid won't believe you. He'll say, wow, no, I don't see any sun, right? Well, that's how the human psyche is. I don't see any sun. It's not because it's not there. It's because our mind's been inundated, crippled, paralyzed, and brainwashed to view things through this black cloud. And, and what happens after, I mean, anybody can put themselves in the black cloud if they really were stupid enough to, to want to do that. But what happens over years and years, it becomes a habit. And people have habits of thinking that are terrible for them, but they don't want to change the habit. And the reason they don't want to change the habit is it's very familiar. It's like, this feels horrible, but this is me. This, this is the real me. So, and... When you, what we're trying to instill in a person is the drive, the insistence, and in a sense, the entitlement to, I, I don't have to function as if that's all there is. I want to dispel the black cloud and see the sun. And, you know, if we have time, we'll talk about the sun, obviously, as, as a symbol. Um, the other thing you should know before we teach you the tool is the, the part X um, and the negative thoughts it creates move very fast. They move so fast you wouldn't believe it. So you're, um, you're being brainwashed quicker than you can actually think yourself. Hmm. It's like some guy putting a hypodermic needle in your neck and, and just injecting these neg negative thoughts right into it. And, and that's to say they're not really measured thought through logical conclusions. They're just poisons. Um, Barry likes to use the... Um, the uh, metaphor, I don't know, whatever it is, of, like if you, t if you had a glass of water and you took a little drop of black ink and you dropped it in, in about three seconds, the whole, the whole glass would be black, right? You just dropped the whole thing in. So that kind of spreading of negativity happens, but it's not a glass of water, it's human beings. And it, it spreads very easily from one human being to another. Um, which, and that, then you're getting into other issues, issues of leadership, you know, a, a bad leader is somebody who lets that kind, kind of negativity run rampant. And believe me, Part X, if you are any kind of executive leader in business or in your family, Part X is always there trying to do that. It's trying to um, poison your mind and then spread the poison out into the social environment. And this is a thing that's not discussed enough as far as I'm concerned. Again, it's better than it used to be. And I just want to add one thing to that, Phil, which is... You know, most people, when they hear that, say, well, I may think negatively, but I keep it to myself. Uh -uh. Doesn't matter. The, the truth is, when you're in the black cloud, people around you sense it. And they start to absorb that energy. And we see this all the time in families and marriages because it's kind of like a single organism. And if one part of the organism is always thinking negatively, you may never speak a word of it. But your kids will pick it up, your spouse will pick it up, and the whole the whole family kind of goes down a notch as a result of that. Yeah, and listen very carefully because this is another power people don't realize they have. And we call it family forces. Let's say you're a warrior, we give you this tool, and um, 
you use the tool and it kind of works a little bit. You know, you're a little more positive, you have a little more control over your mind, etc. That accomplishment will be conveyed to the other family members, not not um, consciously, not not didactically. They will smell it, they'll feel it, and it'll go right inside them. So while you're create, uh, controlling your own thinking and your own negativity, you're actually helping the other family members. It, my experience is it helps them more than if you talk to them about it. Because if you talk to somebody about it, he can consciously resist what you're saying. Family forces go in unconsciously, <clears throat> the person doesn't even know. And there are going to be a lot of examples of that in the new book, where one person works on himself or herself and uses tools over and over and over again. And those family forces sort of spread out into the family and sometimes into business organizations. And they start to see everyone around them functioning on a higher level as a result of what they've done, even though the other people have no idea that they're working on themselves. Yeah. Let's say that again. So somebody who can control their mind, particularly this kind of thing worrying, because most people have never been able to control their mind for two seconds. It wouldn't even occur to them. But if they've tried, they've, they've failed miserably. So once you can sell them on that, everything moves up to a higher level. What were you just saying, Barry? I, someone, someone was saying that the, that the new book is going to have a lot of examples of individuals using tools and literally seeing changes, improvements in the people around them as a result of their use of the tool. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that's very helpful if you believe everything you're saying, which is then if you're a leader, you're, you're actually responsible for controlling your state of mind. It's, it's not just, well, it'll be nicer, it'll we'll feel better. That's, that's a big part of your job. And we, both of us train a lot of executives. And it's one of, it's one of the big things we do is we give them a, a sense of emotional and spiritual res responsibility. Um, all right, let me... Show the tool. I mean, there's a lot more stuff we could talk about. But you have any questions on this, Brian? Just soaking it up, and uh, you know, all the way back to that that glass with the one drop of of black ink. Not only does it affect the family, but I I, I imagine your mind is then whoo, colored that quickly. Yes. The, the speed with which negativity comes in was really impactful for me, and just that practice of slowing down and how our society is constantly clickbaiting us and getting us to go from thing to thing to thing and training ourselves really, right, to have no control of our mind and to default into the negative um, really resonated. And uh, again, just making me more excited to, to check out this part X. Uh, but, but no, all of, it, all of it is great and I'm excited to hear its antidote um, via okay. the application of this tool. Um. You know, I've kind of, I don't feel that good today. I don't, I don't know if I'm up to it. So I'm playing with you. I'm playing with you you got to <laughs> control that thought. Let's get some flow going here. <laughs> There's just a bright sun out, the Phil. Cloud. There's a bright sun out. You just got to look out there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I feel better. <laughs> okay. Here's, here's this way you, you do this. And I'll, I'll teach the tool first and then I'll explain it afterwards. All you need is a couple of things you're grateful for, first of all. And when, I, when, I, um, when we do the tool, you, you'll need them specifically. Here's the key. You can have a big thing like, my kids are healthy, I just got a huge promotion, whatever. But the little things actually are more helpful. And we'll explain why that is. So the little thing is, I'm, I'm grateful I had enough money to eat lunch. I'm grateful I had a good teacher in the second grade. I'm grateful it's, the clouds went away. I'm grateful the waves are good. That's for him. He's California. Um, so you're searching for, you're going to search for things to be grateful for, um, but you want to make sure many of them are off the beaten path. I have a thing with hot water, so I'm very grateful. God knows when, when the hot water works, I'm happy. I came up with a new one today, Phil. Can yeah. I tell you? Yeah. I, I did my senior thesis in 1970 yeah. um, on a Smith Corona. Uh -huh. So, you know, for most of your audience probably doesn't know what that means. What it means is that it's if here. you have to switch around a, a paragraph or oh, oh, switch right. one section, you have to type the whole 150-page thesis over again. So the oh. gratitude that I have for a computer being able to block edit things and move things around is just, it's unbelievable to me. Yeah, yeah. It's that's, like a miracle. Uh, 
Look, let me just say to the audience, he's a, a, um, a lawyer, so I don't know if they... I won't say anything more. Um, okay, so here we go. Here we go back again again. And I'll explain it later. Just let me take you through the procedure. So basically, you, you want to do it for, for a very short period of time, maybe 10, minutes, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Not, not a long time, but you want to get at least three, four different items in. Okay? So I'm grateful I love my grandmother. I'm grateful I had a good breakfast today. I'm grateful there's a beautiful sky. I'm grateful the elevator works, whatever. Now, when you, so you say, I am grateful. Oh, and before we get into this, a lot of people will tell me, I don't need this tool. I'm grateful. Of course I'm grateful. I get up every morning. I feel good. That's good, but it's not good enough. This, this is a procedure to fight Part X. And believe me, it's not going to go down easily. If you just say to Part X, yeah, I'm pretty grateful. He'll say, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, wait till you see what I'm going to inject in your thinking in five minutes. So this is a war. And you have to carry the procedure around. Now, the, the procedures, you know, in terms of what is a tool, they are made to be done easily and quickly. But usually you got to put in 30 seconds of concentration. And the modern person doesn't even want to do that. Anyway, so you're going to say these things slowly. Um, I'm grateful I like my older brother. I'm grateful I'm good in mathematics. I'm grateful it doesn't usually get below 30 degrees in California. Whatever, nice and slow. And as the, you create the thought, you want to feel the gratefulness. And I would say try to feel it right around your chest and your solar plexus or right around near your heart. And so what you're doing is you're creating a series of items to make yourself aware that you're grateful for them. Nice and slow. Now, once you've done that, you, you want to keep remain aware of this force from your heart that's been creating these thoughts, maybe after you've gotten four of them, but you don't want to create any more thoughts. You just want to feel the force itself. So it's a force that's grateful and it wants to create something else to be grateful for, but you won't let it because you want it to just feel it as an upward moving force. And you could say it moves up into your chest. Or so, some people just keep it in their chest area. Now, and that's the grateful flow. But we're not finished yet. Once you have that grateful flow right over here, you want it. So all you've done is you've named your four things. You've stopped the words from coming, just feeling the, the force of gratefulness moving up. Then you want to feel your chest soften really soften, almost like it's no longer solid. And as your chest melts, you want to feel the presence of something of otherworldly um, compassion and giving. Don't try to understand it. Don't try to think what it, what it is. Don't do, define it. Don't do anything like that because that's more thinking. You just want to feel it giving you everything right in your chest area, and let it in, okay? Now, that, okay, you can open your eyes. That's the basis, basic uh, picture of the tool. Do you want to say anything about it, Barry? No, I thought that was great. That's exactly right. Okay. I, the one, well, I would give a couple of tips. One is, um, the way I had to learn this tool was just to start simply by generating five grateful thoughts. And then... After I had done that for a couple of days, maybe a week, then I moved on to the next step, which is to actually feel my heart softening and feeling gratitude. And then after I'd practiced that a bunch of times, then I could feel this otherworldly presence kind of approaching me. So I just don't want people to think they got to get it all right the first time. It's okay to practice these things and get them in increments. We're talking about a a truly powerful spiritual practice and it doesn't necessarily come you know easily unless you practice it and you know forgive yourself for your mistakes and just you know do it over and over and over again it took me a while to to realize that the thoughts were not just thoughts they were openings in my heart for 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 feelings that i hadn't felt in a long long time mm -hmm. yeah let me just tell you two things which is number one barry's the best person, I'm not saying patient, I forget about that, 
best person I've ever seen in terms of his work ethic. It's extraordinary. And when, you, when someone does these tools, if they tell me, well, I tried, I went home and I tried it for 10 minutes, it works great, everything's great, they're just not being honest. In other words, it's a fight to learn how to do these tools. And it's a fight to concentrate once you know how to do them. And then it's even a bigger fight once you feel better because you want to stop doing them. By the way, I guess I should mention, so I don't forget, this is one of the tools that you might do ritualistically, meaning you might do it when you get up in the morning, when you go to sleep, meals, um, anything like that. Most of the tools don't lend themselves to that, but th this one does very much. Now, um, so let me just take everybody through it again once really fast so they can feel it while we go on. Okay, so um, close your eyes and just slowly create uh, things you're grateful for. Try for four of them. Okay, that's good. Keep the flow going now, but no words, no thoughts, no nothing. Just a pure force moving right through your heart. Wants to create. And now feel your chest soften. Like down to jello, completely soften, and you're going to feel this beneficent, benign, giving force, very concerned with giving to you, and you're just going to feel it approach you, and the sense of melting is now going to be melting into and becoming part of that force, however that comes out. Okay, that was excellent. Okay, you know, as I talk, now try to stay a little, you, you want to say something, Brian? No, I was just uh, experiencing that coming back out of that. Okay, good. So again, remember, there's two things you got to remember. Saying I'm grateful, believing in the tool, all that stuff is nice, but it, this, you actually have to do this. And I discovered it 25, 30 years ago. I, I still have to do it. Everybody does. Um, so we're trying to build up, besides the technology, the tool, we're trying to build up this aggressive, uh, you know, willingness. The other thing is a little more technical. When you're trying to name these things, don't always say the same four things. And the reason for that is, again, you want to force yourself to do the work. The work of mixing uh, new ideas in directs your willpower to this beneficent force, which we, we call it the source. Um, if you want to say that in another way, you know, the universe is always creating new things. So you want to kind of make yourself like, make your heart and your mind like the universe. So you're, it takes a certain amount of creativity just to come up with new things each time. And that's why, Phil, I think you originally called the tool the grateful flow. It's mm -hmm. that flow of newness that mm -hmm. actually syncs you up with something greater than you. Just to reflect back some of the, the experience I have as I listen to you guys share, uh, we, we know scientifically that gratitude is so powerful. Just doing it once a week for you know documenting five things increases your happiness by as much as 25% or something ridiculous like that. But th what I love about your work is the, is the practice aspect of it and just being able to notice when that black cloud of worry thoughts comes over and to discipline ourselves with the intensity that Barry talked about and lives with uh, – rigorously and relentlessly and yeah. to, to make it a practice and to get better and better at it incrementally um, is what inspires me the most, you know, just to feel that and to have that if then trigger, if this comes in, then I do this and I won't do it well in the beginning because I've got decades of experience of not doing that. But if I give it time, I'm going to more consistently tap into more deeply this, this extraordinary force. So this is what I love so much about um, this and everything else that we're talking about. Yeah. It's very exciting if you get into it because I don't know, I got into this early for some reason. I remember even as a kid, I couldn't articulate it, but the notion that we as human beings are given consciousness and free will and that we can use that to actually change ourselves, that really excited me. I, I don't know why I was a weird little kid, I guess, but it really turned me on. And that's why the tools turned me on so much was because here were very specific ways that I could leverage problems into potential, 
you know, and, and it, it really do, does become a very exciting thing if, for those who can, who can really apply it diligently. And it's not, if I can highlight that f uh, for a moment, it's not just the depth psychology, archaeological dig therapy of going from negative 10 to negative 5 to 0. It's, okay, cool, we got that. Now, how, what's yeah. the infinite potential that we're capable of yes. if we actually practice this? And again, use these challenges and problems, in quotes, as fuel. Then it's literally like strapping on the, the rocket boosters and, and uh, getting to tour the upper limits of potential, right? That's what's so exciting about it, to see how far you can actually evolve as a human being. It's, and it really gives you a feeling of limitlessness. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when I, um, I was on the freshman uh, basketball team and this kid had we're playing the school of St. Francis in Brooklyn. It was a good school. I gave that scholarship <laughs> Anyway, this kid, John Clifton, had scored 37 points on the freshman team, which was the school record. But there were five minutes left in the game, and the game was tied. And I, I remember to this day, I was 16 years old, the coach said, it's really okay to score more than 37 points. You can keep going. Just because you hit the record, you don't have to stop. And it stuck in my mind. It was 50 years ago. Wow. Um, and that's what we're about here, you know, and, and telling people. That. And that really, I'm sorry, that really makes it, fundamentally different uh, from from most of the therapies. I want to say something about Brian. You know, I saw him, I, I think it was by accident, I don't know, but I saw one of your clips teaching our stuff. Yeah. The first thing I said is, who, who, who is this? Um, the second thing I said is, geez, he's better at it than I am. <laughs> But the third thing I realized is you actually had that work ethic. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the more there's like a overview group of people that are willing to do that, the, the better. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is this. Thank you. Uh, I feel that in my heart and I appreciate your kind words. And uh, it means a lot. And that's the quality that I aspire to to uh, have the most. We're on video chatting, but I don't know if you can see that, but arete is the, the Greek word for their meta virtue of in this moment, are you showing up most fully? And um, so I really appreciate that reflection and that intensity and that, that work ethic is uh, something that I aspire to continue to cultivate. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like that was great. I really like your the meditation. I really felt that. Um, obviously, we can talk about it some more, but I feel great about it. If you guys feel good, and we can talk about active love. Sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's do that. So active love. Uh, yeah. Again, um, Tell, let's talk about this because I, I just this one has really impacted me as well, particularly in my intimate relationship with my wife. You know, and there's that maze of okay, it's easy to run around and, and to kind of uh, Barry and Phil will tell us about the maze, but but from my experience, there's this pattern we have of of worry, which we just talked about, and there's also that kind of anger and that frustration of I'm right, you're wrong, kind of thing, and finding all the reasons why someone's wrong. Um, and uh, to really move from that into using this tool of active love has been um, transformative for me, not just in our relationship, but in all relationships. If any time I feel that niggling of, of anger, um, this is such a beautiful tool to apply. So I'm really excited for you guys to, to explore that however you feel most inspired. That's great, Brian. Yeah, let's start with the problem first. A active love is a tool that's designed for a particular state of mind, which Phil and I call the maze. It's the state of mind, everybody recognizes it, everybody gets into it. When you've been wronged in some way and you can't stop thinking about the person who wronged you, you go over it, what they did to you in your mind, you can't let go of it. And it's like a, it literally is like a maze because you get trapped in it. You know, so your boyfriend flirts with someone and now you're plotting how to humiliate him back. You know, a coworker dismisses an idea of yours and you didn't say anything about it. And now you're coming up with brilliantly cutting remarks that are going to put him down, you know, et cetera. I, I actually saw this in action. Um, a couple of months ago, I, I took an Uber ride and the driver was in the maze, you know, a passenger about a week before that, had gotten into his car incredibly drunk and had vomited all over his upholstery. Don't you tell them the, what the maze is? 
Yeah, it's this state of mind where you can't get over the wrong that's been committed to you. So he'll never see this guy again, but he couldn't let go. He was talking about it with me a week later for the entire ride. So what happens when unfair things happen to us is we feel like it shouldn't have happened. And look, maybe in some perfect world, it shouldn't have happened. There's only one problem with that, which is it did happen. And no amount of thinking about it or anger about it is going to change that fact. So your job is to get past it, to actually minimize its effect on you. Otherwise, you're letting this person who wronged you and what they did to you, you're letting that eat your mind. So whatever you decide to do about it, you may decide to confront the person, you may decide to let it go. The first step is to get yourself out of the maze. Whether you confront the person or not is actually a strategic decision, and you can't make good strategic decisions when you're in the maze. I'm a good example of that. One evening, this was about 20 years ago, thank God, but I spent the entire night composing the nastiest, most poisonous letter I've ever written to a contractor who had kind of screwed me. And I, it, I have to say it was some of the best writing I've ever done. <laughs> but when I woke up, I realized... I can't send this letter. I actually need this guy to complete the job. It was a complete waste of my time. So the question becomes, how do you get out of the maze? And to get out of the maze, you need something stronger than your ego. See, the ego is the part of you that actually makes judgments about what should happen and what shouldn't happen. And it's already decided that this shouldn't happen. It was unfair. And like a little kid, it's going to dig its heels in and stick with that until the wrong gets righted. And good luck with that, because frankly, most wrongs never get righted. You know, the slights and the injuries and the insults just come in and you have to let go of them. Yeah, my favorite was at the beginning of Hamlet, you know, where his father's been killed and his father comes back as a ghost and he says to Hamlet, you must set the balance straight. You know, it's Flora and Shakespeare. And uh, if you read the play, it didn't work too well. <laughs> Everybody was dead at the end. Yeah, it didn't work too well. <laughs> so I'm supposed to say is amazed. <laughs> so, um, no, it's great. So, so while you're in the maze, while you're waiting for the wrong to be righted, all that really happens is life goes on without you. Everyone else is moving on and you're stuck in this horrible state of mind. So if the ego isn't enough to get you out of the maze, you need something else. And what you need is something greater than you. Now, in our first book, we call that a higher force. It doesn't have religious connotations. If you're agnostic or atheistic, don't be put off by it. It just means that it's something bigger than your ego. And in this instance, we identify the higher force that we're talking about with the word outflow. Think of outflow as a force that just loves life in all of its forms, good, bad, beautiful, ugly, fair, unfair. It just completely accepts everything that exists without the judgments and differentiations that the ego makes. It's kind of like sunlight. It just shines on everybody. They don't have to merit it or deserve it. It just shines on them, you know, kind of thing. And it's the force that really embodies, there's this beautiful quote from Rainer Maria Rilke, this early 20th century poet, where he says, life is in the right, always, which means you have to accept everything. Outflow is that force that he's describing. Now, what the tool, Act of Love, does is it syncs you up. It synchronizes you with this force of outflow so that you can get out of the maze and back into life and start participating again, fair or unfair. So um, I think probably the best thing for me to do is to actually give you the tool and have you practice it and see, you know, see how you do. So um, probably the best way for, for me to teach the tool is for you to imagine that someone has wronged you. Just pick an incident from the past or predict something that's going to happen in the future or somebody, you know. All of our examples, because we live in L.A., come from traffic. So somebody cuts you off on the freeway or some, you know, just stops in the middle of the street or, you know, whatever. So you've got that wronged feeling 
going on inside of you. And that's where we can start with the tool. And the tool has three steps. The first step is called concentration. Just imagine that you are surrounded by a warm liquid light that is infinitely loving. And what I want you to do is feel your heart expand far beyond you so that you can become one with this love. Now, as you bring your heart back to normal size, this infinite energy concentrates itself inside your chest. It's this unstoppably compressed loving force that just wants to give itself away. Now we can move on to step two. This is called transmission. Focus on the person who has triggered your anger. Obviously, in this instance, they're not physically in front of you, and usually they're not. So just visualize their presence. And now what I want you to do is send all of the love in your chest directly to them. Hold absolutely nothing back. It's like completely expelling a deep breath. And then comes step three, which is called penetration. Follow the love as it leaves your chest and when it enters the other person at their solar plexus, don't just watch that happening. Feel it enter them. This will give you the sense that you're actually completely one with them. It erases the distinction between you and them. And now just relax. You'll feel yourself once again surrounded by infinite love and it returns to you all of the energy that you gave away. And at that point, you should feel peace. That's it, it's three steps. So it's concentration, where you're concentrating this, this force of outflow inside your heart. It's transmission, where you're sending the outflow to the other person. And it's penetration, where in a sense, the object world disappears. Any distance between you and the other person disappears and you're over it, you're completely through it. Beautiful. Now, let me say one other thing about this. Um, most people, their biggest problem with this is that they get hung up on whether or not they should address the person who did the wrong to them. And their minds keep flipping back to, yeah, but should I talk to them or should I not talk to them? Or what should I do? Or, you know, should I confront them? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And I just want to make an appeal to anyone who's listening to this. Always get yourself out of the maze first before you make that decision because you can't make good decisions in the maze. And it's, you know, in a sense, the philosophy be behind active love is very important. The philosophy is your state of mind is ground zero. It comes first. It has to be more important than anything else that you do, whether you get back at the person or address them or confront them or not. So you can't control most of what happens to you in the outside world. That's why your state of mind is ground zero, because you can control your state of mind, your response to what happens in the outside world. And that's a kind of power that most people never experience. It's what Lao Tzu, the ancient Chinese philosopher, was really trying to address when he said, he who conquers others is strong, but he who masters himself is mighty. And that's the kind of might that active love creates. It says, I will, I will never disconnect myself from outflow, no matter what you do to me. And if you reread Martin Luther King's speech on loving your enemies, you'll see the whole spirit of this is embodied in that speech. I mean, there's never been, well, there have been, but this is a man who was really severely persecuted by, by, the, by almost every state in the South. And he said in this speech, I refuse to hate. I refuse to seek revenge. I will not, that would be the worst thing that I could do to myself. And I won't let that happen. Yeah. Um, 
I, I just want to add a couple of things. Uh, do we have to stop? No, no that was amazing. Okay. <laughs> that was awesome, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, two things. Number one, um, you if people always say, well, especially where I grew up, you know, are you, are you a sissy? You know, you're going to let somebody diss you or step to you? And, and the answer is very interesting, which is, if, I mean, now in my old age, if I had to punch you in the face, I would want to do the tool and be full out full. And the reason would be I would need less from you. The whole the purpose of the tool is don't try to get what you need from the other person because that gives them power over you. So what, what do you get in this tool? You get the sense of connection to the whole. You get the sense you're part of the universe. You get the sense that no matter how egregious, heinous, evil the other person is, they can't stop you anymore from being in this outflow state. Now, that, that outflow state and punching somebody in the face are very similar, actually. Now, if, in, if you're in the maze, oh, you did this to me and you I can't believe you better apologize, you, you stiffen up and you're not going to be as good of a fighter. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, it's not a license to, to do that, obviously, but just to, to deal with that objection. Um, the second thing that's very interesting is if you have to confront somebody or, or tell them something or be in an uncomfortable situation, send active love to them first. Send it right into the situation. You'll find to your amazement, I would say about 50% of the time, that will change the valence. It'll change the tra trajectory of the meeting. And sometimes you think a guy's going to jump right on your case and you do that. And somehow the peace of mind gets transmitted to him also. And he's a, a little bit nicer to you. Can I give an example of that? This yeah. is an amazing example. This happened to me like 25 years ago. My mother was a, Phil knew her actually. She was a difficult woman. She was, she was an amazing mother in many, many ways, incredibly creative, really bright. I mean, just taught me philosophy from, you know, a very early age, but she was very difficult. And the people she was the hardest on were my older sister and me. And just to give you an example, when I was a young parent, I mean, my kids were very, very young. I was working incredibly long hours. I would see like 10 patients a day, come home at about eight o'clock grab some dinner, maybe spend a little bit of time with them, go to sleep, and then get up, you know, the next morning. And it would just, like, be like that every day of the week. One, one night, I came home. It was about 8 o'clock. I was just exhausted. The kitchen was a mess. I made myself some dinner. I was just sitting down to it, and the phone rang. And I picked up the phone. It was my mother <laughs> on the other end. And she, she didn't even say hello. She literally said, Barry, there's a light bulb out over my bed, and if you don't get over here and change it now, I'm going to find another son who will click. <laughs> this is my mother. Did that bother this, you? This, what'd you say? Did that bother you? <laughs> and this was fairly routine, you know, for my mother. I must have used active love 20 or 30 times after that phone call, and I decided to get in my car and go over there, and I... She answered the door and I went in and I ch changed the light bulb. And I don't think I could have done this without the tool. I sat down with her and said, now look, you've alienated everyone in your life except for me. You can't ever speak to me that way again. Do you understand that? And amazingly for a woman who was so hard, she burst into tears and she said, I know, I'm so sorry. I feel abandoned so easily that I come out swinging and that's why people abandon me, you know, kind of thing. It was like an amazing moment and it's indicative of those family forces that we were talking about earlier. If you can change yourself, very often, I'm not saying it's a guarantee or anything, but very often other people rise to the level that you've achieved. I have a question. When, we're, when we discuss these, these tools, each of them in their own right is obviously so powerful. Is the way to build the capacity to practice them, practicing them? Or is there, and or is there a meta practice that you encourage um, your patients and clients to follow? Uh, I'll leave it at that. Well, I'll go ahead, Ben. Uh, I was just going to say, practicing them is number one. 
Number two is making connections with other people, whether it's in the form of a tools group, which by the way, there is one that has formed in New York and there are others around the country. But even just having one person to check in with regularly and discuss whatever problem you're having and get advice on which tool to use and report into someone about whether or not you're using it, times that you've lapsed, times that it just, you know, just like a 12 step group, you know, keeps people sober, any kind of contact, regular contact with someone else keeps you straighter in your use of tools. That's great. Phil, were you going to say something? There's a, there's a thing in couples therapy. This is, see, these tools apply to couples therapy as well as, as regular therapy. Now, here's what happens in couple therapy. First of all, 50% of the therapists are not very good at it. So forget them because they, they make things worse. The other 50%, they will, the key to couples therapy is what, oh, what I call the interface. In other words, it doesn't matter who did what to who 32 years ago. It doesn't matter where you go. The only thing that matters is how you interact every day when you are together. And the classic interface time is the, the, the husband comes home from work at 7.30 at night. His wife is tearing her hair out. There's two little kids destroying the living room. That's his in interface. But interface could be any time you're basically coming back into contact with, with somebody. Now, so, and they're, they're fairly classic problems with the interface. So um, here's, the, here's the most common one. Somebody tends to be withdrawn, right? Let's say the guy, he gets home and he wants to withdraw and read all the newspapers and his, his phone and all this stuff, right? Um, so, and he'll overdo it. Now, that's his part X, the fact that he wants to do that. He wants withdrawal. Now, the wife's part X very commonly, not all the time, of course, is clinginess, neediness, fear of abandonment. That's her part X, okay? Then you get an interlock between the two X's. He starts to withdraw. She starts to feel abandoned, just what Barry was saying. He, feel, he feels she's clinging. She's on his case. He'll withdraw even more. She'll then get more abandoned, okay? So we call that interlocking X's. It's the, it's the neurotic part of the personalities dancing with each other. That's their interface. So their it's interface. literally a self-reinforcing cycle where each part X is reinforcing the part X in the other. Yes. Um, so yeah, so that's an escalating cycle. I've side. never experienced that. <laughs> <laughs> you live in a monastery then. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was yesterday morning, I don't know. <laughs> now here's the thing, okay, so I'm the shrink, so I see it's clear what the problem is, right? So I can tell the husband, stop withdrawing, be more present, and I can tell the wife, back off, give him some room. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's fine. At least if the shrink knows that and sees it as well, it's great. But it's not great enough because you got part X screwing the pooch here, you know, trying to mess it up. So they need tools. So just to go back to the tool that this fantastic presentation Barry just gave, um, Let's say in this case, it would probably be more applicable to the husband because he's trying to withdraw. She's on his case. He's getting angry. Then he's starting to get sullen. And he's complaining about things she did 22 years ago to him, whatever. He has to use that tool right in that moment. It doesn't matter what he knows. If he doesn't use the tool, he can't change his state. If he can't change his state, her part X is still going to be on his case. She won't believe it. And people are mistrustful anyway. So this is, it's really not that complex, but it's, it's one of the things, one of the reasons that, uh, this particular tool is so important. It's almost like a world level importance because th to me, this is the problem in the world right now. And it's great for people to talk about it, but it's not, it's not great enough. That's one of our missions um, is to try to get these things out. Enough said. Yes. I want to add on, on something onto what Phil said, two things actually. The, the first is that another amazing concept that I learned from Phil uh, that's directly applicable to couples therapy is unilaterality. Mm -hmm. it means that husband is going to have to use that tool, active love, regardless of whether his wife is working on herself or not. Because there are times when everyone lapses and forgets or just is 
too roughed up by their own part X to use the tool. And what we want in couples therapy is to get the couple to the highest common denominator, not the lowest common denominator. If you're only willing to use a tool when your partner's using the tool, you're functioning at the lowest common denominator. If you're using, if you're using a tool unilaterally, like I don't care whether she does it or not, I'm doing it for myself, then very likely she'll rise up to that level and vice versa. I'm not being sexist about it. I just, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a place where we all tend to absolve ourselves of individual responsibility. And the answer is I'm taking that responsibility for myself. That's it. It's bottom line. Yeah. And that's real emotional leadership. Not just talking about it. That's doing it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's amazing too because it's it's only when both individuals in a dyad are in that X state that the real fireworks occur, right? If one of you is up, even if it's not using a tool, you just happen to be in a better mood and you don't get down, then it won't happen. So it's just fascinating for me to observe that in my own relationship and to to do what you're talking about. Of well, it's unilateral responsibility of be the one that's stepping up uh, when it's. You know, when that little ex is trying to get you to, to see all the reasons why the other person is being the one, if they just change, everything would be okay. It's yeah. amazing because I, I my wife is a shrink also, so, and, I, and I'm a shrink, so I observe myself. And there are times when I can't control my part X, and I notice that if my wife doesn't respond and she just does her – I can feel my ex wanting to pull her in and wanting to provoke her, and I'm watching my part ex lose, and I'm so grateful to her at the same time for not feeding into it. It's yeah. kind of amazing to watch. That's it. really cool. Yeah. Well, this is good. We covered a ton. Um, thank you so much for your your. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. You really bring out the best in us. Yeah. Well, it's really inspiring. Um, I hope everyone gets as much as I got out of um, our chat today. Uh, Again, can't wait for the next book. Um, Part X is the title, working title. We don't have a title yet, right. to be honest with you. But Part X is the the subject of the book. Yeah. It is, it's that's what we're going to get into. This is good. Um, early 2017 is what uh, Barry and Phil are, are planning on. Um, I really look forward to getting a, a copy of that and uh, having another one of these chats uh, timed around your release of that book. Um, for now, remind me the best place that people can go to discover more. Thetoolsbook.com, and you can sign up there for bi-monthly uh, newsletters that we send out with you know, inspiring stories and other information about the tools and all, that, all of that good stuff. Okay, fantastic. Thetoolsbook.com, um, I've already praised it so much, I will... Uh, Praise it one more time. Awesome. Get it. <laughs> Check it out. Transformative. Practice it. Um, Barry and Phil, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, this is Brian. A lot of people don't know all the stuff I do beyond these free videos I share on YouTube. So I thought I'd do a quick video to give you an overview of our membership program that you can get access to and get a ton of other stuff. Uh, so here's a quick look. 10 bucks a month. Join the Optimal Living Membership Program. You get instant access to 250 philosopher's notes on some of the best optimal living books out there. Old school classics, positive psychology, modern stuff, mindfulness, peak performance, purpose, neuroscience, wealth, etc. Um, and what you may not know is that in addition to the PNTV episodes, I create PDFs on all of these great books. So six-page PDFs. Let's take a look at one of them. Joseph Campbell. You want to figure out how to live your hero's journey. Well, this is a great place to start. I basically pull out my favorite big ideas, riff on them, connect them to other books and other ideas, and help you apply this wisdom to your life today. That's what the PDF looks like. Again, we have 250 of these on all these different great books. And then I record those PDFs as an MP3. So you can listen to that MP3 while you're on a walk or working out or doing some errands or whatever. Um, that is Philosopher's Notes. Uh, a lot going on there. And then in addition to Philosopher's Notes, you get access to Optimal Living classes, Optimal Living 101. Idea here is that all those great teachers come back to the same big ideas again and again and again. I distill those ideas into classes. Super practical, fun, inspiring classes, ranging from Habits 101, Confidence 101, 
Getting Stuff Done 101, Meditation 101, instant access to all those classes. And then future classes include Relationships 101, Energy 101, Purpose 101, Business, Goals, etc. Those are our full-length classes. And then I create micro classes, two to three to five minute little bursts of wisdom on my favorite great ideas from these great books across the domains that you want to optimize in your life. So we have dozens of these so far. I create 50 new micro classes every month and 10 new philosopher's notes every month for 10 bucks a month. So we're blessed to have thousands of members who are uh, enjoying the program and sharing some incredibly kind words with us. And uh, super simple, 10 bucks a month, cancel any time. Would be honored to be a bigger part of your life. And I appreciate your support. And uh, here's to optimizing and actualizing.